All right, welcome back to class today. Today I thought I would share with you some of the uh, slides uh, that I took while I was in Africa in 1997. These slides are mostly from 1997, although I continued to work there in summers until mm, 2001. I was in central Kenya in a fairly arid part of uh, the country just north of the equator in between uh, Nairobi and Somalia. All right, I'd like to talk today a little bit about ethno-archaeological research that I did in uh, the late 90s, early 2000, between 1996 and 2001. Uh, on summers, I was uh, traveling to East Africa uh, central Kenya. Uh, the view here is showing a small, um, actually let me set the stage uh, a little further back. I was in Africa uh, to do work on my dissertation, which was an archaeological study of a river basin. However, living nearby was, uh, were pastoralist nomads. When I first arrived in the area, many, many people had fled the area. Uh, apparently there was warfare going uh, on between uh, two tribes, uh, the Somali tribe and the Samburu tribe. The Samburu are the sort of um, dominant population group in the area with the Somali tribe, uh, a minority. The people you're looking at here are members of a third tribe, Turkana. Other uh, minorities in the area would be Maasai. Uh, but some cattle wrestling had occurred between the Somali and, and Samburu uh, ethnic groups. And in preparation of violence, uh, virtually everybody had left the area. So this entire uh, area that you can see here, all the way to the mountains there, and an equal distance behind me here, was sort of abandoned, if you will, um, for the most part. However, here, uh, there was a small uh, Catholic uh, school that uh, gave a free education to pastoralist children was located and just outside the school uh, there was a small encampment of Turkana pastoralists. Turkana are East African cattle pastoralists much like the Samburu. Their home area is much further to the north. So these folks for whatever reason this group of Turkana were living down here. I did a survey of the group. There's about 200 or so people living in the area, many of them related to one another, many of them not. Uh, I made friends with uh, one particular family and uh, learned a lot about Turkana culture from them. One morning as I uh, was walking over to this camp, this is what I saw. Uh, I was unable to actually, uh, uh, this is about 9, 10 a.m. in the morning. If I had arrived just a little bit earlier, I would have seen that hut in the center would have been covered, just like the one on the left is. What was happening was that these folks were in the process of quickly moving on. So we went from a, a situation where um, their camp looked completely stable, and then the following morning, um, this is what we have. We have this entire encampment has been abandoned. There are armature frameworks left where their, some of their huts had been, and they were just flat out gone. In ethnoarchaeology, we, we look for natural experiments that will help us uh, learn about the, uh, to develop middle range theory to help us understand and link behavior to the archaeological record. In this particular case, uh, right in front of me, I was seeing the abandonment of a pastoralist camp and what sort of archaeology would be left behind when they left. So going back in time a little bit, I just have a few slides I can show you that show sort of the moving process. People gathering together all of their belongings and put, putting them in these, uh, these uh, basket-looking devices in the foreground are uh, luggage carriers. And pretty much everything that would fit in someone's house 
would fit in one of these luggage carriers. Now if you take a look at the house, you'll see that it's covered with boxes, um, some cloth, uh, and other sort of scavenged materials. And that's because this camp was already something of a refugee camp. They had moved here from uh, somewhere else. If they had lived here for a long time, this would be either covered with leather, uh, cowhide of some sort, or mud, making a, a solid dome-shaped structure. There's a, usually a hole in the ceiling where smoke can get out. Well, they're not terribly large, maybe eight foot in diameter. Comfortable for one or two people. Uh, but you can tell by the construction of this particular house and the one to the left that these were temporary housings. So, well, they had moved here at the same time the warfare started. They had been scattered a little bit out, a little bit further out but they sort of coalesced around this school when uh, violence broke out. They were essentially uh, looking after each other in these uncertain times, so they bonded together here. Uh, it was unclear to me now if things had gotten worse or if things had gotten better. Were they moving back to where they had lived before or were they moving on to another location? You'll see a group of men there in the back right and they were discussing and what was going to happen next. You'll also see some structures back there, and those are some of the outbuildings that are affiliated with the, the little school I was talking about. Uh, back in the camp, you'll see mostly it's women doing the loading and unloading. Women are in charge of the entire domestic sphere. They are pretty much in charge of building, maintaining, packing, unpacking, anything to do with the house uh, is their, dom their domain. Uh, another shot of loading up the family belongings and a shot of loading the donkey with pretty much everything they own and uh, getting ready to move out. I'm going to zip through some slides here because these slides are somewhat repetitive and I want to get to the archaeology at the end just a few comments, um, a few comments <clears throat> here. The foreground there shows uh, someone decided to take the actual armature framework house with them. So they cut this uh, house in half and laid it down there. You can see it really doesn't look like much, I guess. The next slide shows you uh, a woman carrying the house on her head to its new location. In, I guess she decided that it would be easier to just transport the house that she had just built than it would be to build a new one. So she takes the armature with her. Presumably she'll uh, place that down wherever she's going to end up. In her right hand she's got a machete there and I'll show you later how they use the machetes to help uh, build the house at its new location. These girls were headed uh, also to their new location and they have a little puppy there. I took a little picture of a puppy there for, for cuteness value. You know, uh, that little puppy, uh, which if you can make out, is right there underneath that lock box there. Poor little guy fell out right after I took this picture and got stepped on by the donkey. Yeah, in any case. Okay, so back to the empty camp. The <coughs> and there, in a typical abandonment process in archaeology, people take everything of value with them. If you go back to these slides, you know, in here you see everything of value they have packed up. And what have they left behind? What they've left behind mostly is stuff that nobody wants. With the exception of the armature frameworks, which do represent a bunch of labor, and who knows, women may or may not come back and salvage some of these materials. Even if they didn't salvage them, it wouldn't be long before time and weather destroyed, destroyed these items. You see a little piece of sheet metal over there that had been scavenged, uh, but you really don't see much in the way of personal effects. And this is typical in archaeology of the sorts of things that we have at our disposal. Inside here you have little bits of trash uh, along the edges. You have the armature framework, and then you have this 
small fireplace. So if we were to find this archaeologically, if this were to somehow become buried, uh, we would see uh, relatively rockless sediments with a group of cobbles or small boulders put into a semicircular ring in the center. And then you would see post holes around the outside. Or you see holes where these uh, pieces of wood are sticking. Now in a later slide I'll show you a little bit more about how the houses are manufactured but what happens is uh, they dig uh, a series of holes that represent the diameter of the house and they put clusters of sticks in each of those holes. Uh, before I get to that I do have a couple of slides here just because uh, a lot of folks like to understand a little bit more about pastoralism and what it means. They, these particular Turkana own goats and camels and would be considered poor by the Samburu standards. Samburu, when they live here in larger numbers, their predominant uh, livestock would be cattle and they represent wealth in terms of how much cattle you own and owning goats and camels is considered much lower status. So one of the things that's important about uh, pastoralism is that it is a, is a good adaptation for this environment. If you think of this environment, it's not terribly productive agriculturally. It, you really couldn't grow much here. You could try to hunt here, but there really are too many people to live off of, of uh, what animals you could hunt in this area. There's you know, hundreds and hundreds of people living here just with the Turkana. And when the Samburu are back, you can imagine a population density of potentially uh, three, 400 people per square mile, especially in the immediate area. And there just isn't, there just isn't enough um, food available for to live exclusively off hunting and gathering. So you have a method of, li of living that where you take uh, animals that can eat whatever is growing on the savanna, <clears throat> whether it be grass or leaves or even sticks, um, goats and whatnot can eat almost, uh, almost anything organic. They take this otherwise um, <clears throat> otherwise uh, inedible environment and they convert it into something that humans can live off of which is animals. Uh, they can drink the milk of an animal and they can of course eat the meat of the animals. However, when, you are, when your entire wealth uh, is represented by your herd, you don't typically want to kill them very frequently. So they have adapted by taking blood out of animals which gives them all the proteins that they need. And they take this blood and they can mix it with milk and it's quite healthy. And uh, most of these particular uh, folks here are actually, I have a picture later that we can give you a better idea of the health, of, health status of some of these folks. But uh, I just wanted to show you taking blood out of a camel. They take uh, uh, this, uh, gentleman on the left, his name is Chamali, and he really was eager to show me how this is done. And he shoots the, the uh, camel in the neck with a, an arrow. And you see the arrow has a little tether on it, and so he, he doesn't want to kill the animal. He really just wants to nick it. So he takes this arrow, and he shoots it, and the tether prevents it from going into the camel's neck. It just creates a stream of blood, and in this next image, if you look really carefully, you can actually see the blood just starting to come out. But uh, they gather the blood into this bucket. They then take that blood and uh, stir it up. Um, they know how much blood they can take out of this camel. Um, they don't want the camel to die. They want the camel to live. Camels produce a lot of milk, and even male camels uh, are valuable. This is where they stir the blood up and they're essentially uh, taking out fibrin. Fibrin is a blood clotting agent that occurs naturally in, in blood. And by taking it out, their blood will, will last longer and stay liquid longer. Uh, they can either throw away the fibrin that 
coagulates on this stick or they can eat it directly. Uh, there you see an Aquafina bottle in the back right. I uh, brought that with me and there's actually a funny story behind me giving those bottles to them. If you ask me about it in class, maybe I'll tell you the story about me and the Aquafina bottles. Uh, I've got some other slides here for a different lecture. This one on body modification. You see the scarification. This one on getting water in the desert. You can see there is actually a rainstorm that comes through here, and you see actually there is a little bit of surface water there, but they don't collect water from the surface, they dig for it. And in this case, the water is very shallow. I've seen times when you can have uh, women down in a pit that's two or three times their height uh, trying to get water out. But in this particular instance, what they do is uh, she's going to dig a hole there, and the water is muddy after she's done digging it. But what she's doing right now, she scoops out all the muddy water after she's done digging the hole and lets the water fill back in slowly. And as it fills back in slowly, it's much clearer. And she is able to collect a clear water in that fashion. I could tell you from some of those earlier pictures a little bit about ethnic groups, but I'll skip that for now. Uh, here's a picture of the family that uh, I w had made friends with and was closest to. A couple of things you'll notice: this is all this is all one a fairly closely related family. There's only one person in this whole picture who is not uh, genetically related to the others. Um, the man in the uh, in the red reddish uh, cloth on the on the, the older man on the right there uh, his name his name is Escone he's the sort of head of household the other adult males are his children his sons uh, two women to his right are his second and third wife you'll see that his second wife there uh, has a um, is wearing a cross she is ostensibly Catholic again that's probably a lecture for another time uh, Nemoy, the girl on the far right, she also wears a crucifix. I don't know if you can see it in this picture. Something, first of all, all of those adults are taller than me. These folks are, are strong. They are relatively healthy. Um, of course, I have no idea what their internal parasites are, but y you can see just by looking at them that they're, they're well built. The, their teeth a lot of students comment to me on their teeth. Their teeth are white and perfect. And this is not something that it, people typically think of when, the, when I ask students what they imagine the teeth of people who are like who live out <clears throat> as pastoralists <coughs> out in the desert. Uh, I, sometimes I, I, I think the sort of the stereotype suggests that they're not healthy. But these folks with their strong diet of milk and blood they grow up strong and healthy and they have healthy teeth. They spend a lot of time brushing their teeth, believe it or not. They take off pieces of that acacia tree and they'll chew on that and brush their teeth with this, uh, with, a, with a frayed stick. So they've all got impeccable uh, teeth. Oh, there's a better, maybe a better picture of Nasire um, showing her, her uh, crucifix in the front or a beaded necklace and a very distinctive Turkana look to her. She's got uh, earrings uh, going up each ear, um, sort of leaf-shaped earrings. Her, her scalp is shaved except for a thin strip down the center. That's a very uh, Turkana style. It's really indicative of her ethnicity. Over here you have a picture of Essacone and Nasure in their Sunday best attire. Uh, standing next to a young Dr. Pearl. Um, I'm the one on the right. Uh, just in case you're wondering. This is, this is for scale, I suppose. To show you that these folks are all taller than me. And he, well, enough said about that. Uh, took pictures of some of the animals for another lecture. I collected uh, lots of... Uh, songs while I was there. I worked with the gentleman to my right. His name is Lawrence. 
Lawrence Peyot, and he was uh, my key informant and, inter and, and interpreter as, the, as I was working in this area. He helped me collect a lot of data, and he was he was actually learning a lot about uh, his own culture as as I was, because he didn't grow up living with uh, Turkana out here. He grew up in a town. Uh, moving on, I would like to get to the house construction section. Poor Lawrence. Ah, stop. All right, where was I? All right, moving on. Here you can see uh, the process of beginning house construction. Uh, you see a couple of holes have been excavated in the foreground uh, and also at right these holes are excavated first uh, with a machete. Then uh, she's got there a she's got there a digging stick, and she is tamping in the dirt around some of the sticks that she's put in there. These sticks are not long enough to go completely over in a uh, arch like a tent, but they're they're long enough to make a curve that ends at the at the top. I think the next slide will show you uh, about how long some of these sticks are. You'll see they cluster them though into these into these uh, holes that they've that they've excavated. Notice how uh, little kids usually are just if they can't walk, they're just slung onto the back, and women will continue to work uh, with kids on their backs uh, very routinely. So here you get an idea of how long some of those sticks are and about how thick they are. They're maybe three quarters of an inch thick to one inch thick at the base and maybe six to eight feet tall. And they put these uh, sticks into a hole. They uh, meet at the top. It takes a number of people to do this effectively, although you probably could do it by yourself. It's a lot easier when you have people to help you. So this is an example of sort of the community coming together and helping this uh, lady with a her couple of kids um, build her house. This shows you so the houses being uh, lashed together at the top, a couple of side supports coming in. Um, this lady here is bringing in uh, softer pieces of, of uh, organic material. These, these are sort of uh, strips of bark that can be used to tie things together. You get an idea here that a house is about tall enough to stand up in almost. And this is actually, house is a little bit small. Uh, I think they probably made this a little quickly because they knew I was there watching. Um, uh, I'm pretty sure that they took this house down fairly close after they built it and made it a little wider because it ended up being a little bit too narrow. It's got about the right height though. There you go, you see more. And if they wanted to take more time, they would uh, space the holes closer together. And you can see how in this picture, how they're kind of tied together with the um, bark. They get that bark wet if they can, otherwise it is tied in there and it dries out and it's very, very strong once it dries out. And she's tying it together there. A couple of ladies helping out. And this lady in the foreground wearing Nikes. Now they're, at this point they're starting to put on the coverings. Now I mentioned that these folks were refugees. Uh, if you were to head up into northern Turkana, you'd see, Turkana area, you'd see these houses are all covered, again, either by cowhide or by mud. This mud, uh, which in Swahili is called mandazi, <clears throat> is a mixture of, of dirt, uh, ash, and cow dung. 
it holds together really well yeah, and it's a great insulator and it's most houses in the Samburu area are covered in that mandazi, that mud structure. It, it makes a nice little semicircular, uh, semi-permanent uh, dome here that's uh, a little bit like uh, an igloo, if you will. It a, it's provides a lot of protection from the heat, the cold, and the rain as well. And even though they're made out of mud, they're relatively water resistant. Uh, certainly through a couple of storms and you can always patch them up or put additional mud coats on the outside and the inside. This one is though covered with burlap, plastic, um, bags, paper, whatever they can find. Uh, supplies were were harder, harder to come by at this particular refugee time. They only planned on living here for a little while. Uh, the truth is we're seeing the birth of a small settlement uh, if you look at satellite photos today, you can see this entire area has grown up into a settled area. There's probably a paper in there somewhere. Here's the final results. Uh, you have um, this uh, lady, this is her house, her two children, uh, and some of her relatives and kin standing around the outside. So this house is intended for a lady and two kids. Uh, she did not have a husband. She, uh, Lawrence told me, uh, indicated that she was divorced. This is, of course, after having told me a week earlier that they don't have any such thing as divorce in their culture. Uh, I suppose that's another story. But since we're doing archaeology class, I just wanted to point out to you that all of this effort uh, is something that we can't see in the archaeological record. It's archaeologically invisible. What do we find when we are excavating? What we will find are post holes. We will find, if we're exceptionally fortunate, we'll find post holes, we'll find potentially the bottoms of the <clears throat> posts that were put in there. But undoubtedly these materials that they're using here are so ephemeral that they would probably um, dissolve away and not withstand the test of time. So you might find the holes that these that were excavated and if you're fortunate they may leave the fire ring intact in the center or you might find ash in the center uh, a darkening where they were living depending on how long they live here something I don't cover in this video but I cover uh, in a paper that I am working on shows you how all of these houses that are built are related to one another in space so you have families that live near each other and they form themselves into a ring, a rather large ring. And in the center of that ring, you have a large corral where the community keeps their animals. So all of these things I was recording in an effort to better understand what the archeological record might look like if we were to excavate maybe a single house. You know, what's the relationship between the size of a house and who is in it? What's the relationship of the location of a house to other houses and the social status, uh, social relationship of individuals who live next door to one another, for example? These are all things that I recorded with a combination of the census, um, watching them build houses, making maps of the houses they built, and so forth. Anyway, I hope you've enjoyed this uh, little brief introduction to... Uh, ethnoarchaeology, uh, the ethnoarchaeology that I did, and when we come back to class next time. We'll talk about we'll talk more about ethnoarchaeology uh, using examples by Lewis Binford. All right, take care.